The worst riots for decades in Paris and across France, ostensibly over fuel tax, forced President Emmanuel Macron to make his first major U-turn after 18 months in office. What will be the consequences for a man that many thought would reform France? And where did it all perhaps go wrong? Very good once again to have your company. I'm David Foster. You're watching Roundtable. Emmanuel Macron, the former investment banker who'd never held office, now president of France. He called for a democratic revolution to reform the country, but his momentum's been thrown into reverse and his approval rating is at an all-time low. It was November the 17th when the so-called Yellow Vest movement took to the streets to protest President Emmanuel Macron's fuel tax. But what started as a protest by French drivers turned to violence and rioting. Finally, the Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, announced the tax would be suspended for at least six months, saying no tax is worth jeopardising the unity of the nation. The tax was part of an environmental policy, discouraging people from using their cars. But now the protests have grown into a wider anti-Macron movement. What does this mean for Macron's vision and mission to change France? Let's get the conversation going. Introducing to you via Skype from Paris, first of all, we have Van Megadishian, an independent political commentator, also in the French capital, Karina Pais, a journalist and fellow at the Institute of Current World Affairs. With me in the studio at the round table, Dr. Joseph Dorning, a specialist in French politics at the London School of Economics, and Dr. Russell Foster, lecturer in European politics at King's College London. I'm going to come to you two in Paris in just a moment, if I may, because I know that both of you were out on the streets of the capital at the weekend. But let's get your expert analysis, your academic analysis, starting first of all, if I may, with you, Joseph. This isn't about fuel tax. If it isn't about fuel tax, what is it about? So it is about everything, and it's about nothing in the same sentence. So basically, this is a general, I think, discontent with uh, coming from the lower middle, sort of upper working classes that see their standard of living constantly eroded in France. They see a massive uh, jump in the, in the cost of living when the euro was introduced that's not gone down again. It's just continually everything's going up. Taxes are rising. They're seeing a, a president who wants to make their working conditions less secure. Um, and it's just ba it's basically kind of about general discontent. The problem is, if you speak to people in France, and we've got polls that back this up, everybody is pro-reform. The problem is, they want reform, just not to their privileges. Yeah, let's get all the cars off the road, but not mine. Yes, it, precisely. It, it, it's that I don't like traffic, but I want <laughs> to drive. You know? <laughs> Tell me, um, if, you, if you would, Russell, why he's proved to be so unpopular, because he promised reform. Was it simply that he didn't deliver, or couldn't deliver? Well, Macron has never been a, a, a popular candidate for the French presidency. Let's not forget that in the 2017 presidential elections, uh, when it got through to the second round, when Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the hard-left candidate, had been knocked out, and there was a choice between Emmanuel Macron or Marine Le Pen, a popular slogan was, ni bon qui est, ni raciste. We want neither a banker nor a racist. For so many French voters, Emmanuel Macron, the young investment uh, banker from liberal Paris, for them he represented the worst excesses of the system which had failed and resulted in the Great Recession and rising populism. So when the French people were offered a choice between an investment banker or a Nazi, they took the investment banker. And he has never been popular uh, since then. He is effectively seen as the president of the rich. This is a man who spends an awful lot of public money on cosmetics for TV appearances, on carpets for the presidential palace, on hand-painted dinner services, while at the same time saying that French people who are already feeling the economic squeeze have to pay more taxes for crumbling services. OK, let, let's find out what it was like to be in Paris uh, over the weekend. Karina, if, if I may come to you first of all, uh, what did you see? Were you surprised by what happened? I'm not surprised that these movements broke out. I think that everything that they just said kind of shows that all of the ingredients were there. Macron was never a particularly popular leader. He's also proved to be incredibly out of touch. Um, it's only tonight that he's supposed to make an appearance to actually address the demands of the protesters. Up until now, he's kind of sent his prime minister, Edouard Philippe, 
who has more political experience than he does to kind of deal with all of this outrage, um, which is in perfect continuity with his image as the president of the rich and just more generally as someone who is aloof and out of touch with the working class. So no, I'm not surprised. Uh, Van, I, I was in uh, northern France a couple of weeks ago and uh, we were held up by the Gilets Jaunes um, very politely, very nicely, not for very long. What we're seeing in Paris and in other places over, over the weekends that have followed that is something entirely different. So when you were out on the streets on Saturday or Sunday, uh, what do you think you encountered? Listen, the, the thing that is very surprising to me in the past few weeks is the fact that when I, whenever I go on the street, whenever we are on the street looking at these people, they're trying to demonstrate, they're trying to rally, uh, they have a preparation. Most of them are not organized. The, the only thing they have organized is wearing the same color. And, and all of a sudden, um, instead of like having a peaceful demonstration, there is, for some reason, something's happening and there are clashes between the police and the protesters. Now, my question is, why is that happening? Why does that keep happening? There is, some are accusing the, about the violence on protesters' part. They're saying protesters are causing violence. They're breaking, etc. But the, the riot police, usually, in Western democracies, in, 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 in Europe specifically, when protests happen, the riot police are there to secure the protest, make sure it is peaceful. Everything was peaceful on Saturday in the beginning. Everybody was hopeful that no violence will take place. And all of a sudden, there is a clash. It's as if the cops are deployed to clash with the protesters. And it's as if the protesters are there to clash with the police. That There was this sense of this clash that was uh, Ill, no, as if it was intended, people want to clash. So, so are, are the people that you're seeing who are now representing this, this, if you if you could call it a movement, who happen to be all dressed the same but come from uh, so many different points of view, are they led by provocateurs? Is that what you're saying? Look, it's like it's like it's like everybody. Uh, like you know, we're talking to each other right now. None of us. Uh, are very similar to each other. We, we, might have, we might share views, we might disagree and everything, but we might have our different manners. And in, on the streets in Paris, where, when you have an opportunity like that for people to express anger, you always have these types of people, the violent, the, violent, the rioters, to come in. You know, it, mm. in the UK, it's the same thing. But once these people are let loose, once if, if, the, if the riot police are unable to make sure that protests can take place peacefully, then the concept of protest, a demonstration, a free expression is completely endangered in a country like France. Okay. Well, I'll come to you too in just a moment. Mm -hmm. I want to ask mm -hmm. Karina one more question. Um, to see protests in France and to see governments buckle under those protests is, is nothing new, whether it's farmers dumping tons and tons of manure outside the Elysee Palace or, or what we're seeing. How, here now, but this seems to be different. Is that the sense that you get, Karina? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely different. And in response to to um, he just said, I, there were a lot of people wearing the yellow vests on Saturday, but there were also a lot of people who weren't wearing the yellow vests. Um, I saw protesters just who went to demonstrate against a host of issues. You know, I mean, the the fuel taxes, like you said, were kind of what the straw that broke the camel's back. But these protests are much broader um, than that. So I, I think it's m maybe one of the first times in a while that such diverse segments of society have kind of united in anger around Macron. Um, so, you know, the yellow vests were maybe the start of, I wouldn't even call it a movement, just kind of an aggregation of discontent. Um, but it's something much larger than that now. So, so, so if the anger is directed at one man in particular who has kept himself, as has been suggested, away from the firing line, perhaps until, until the beginning of this week, what aspect of his character is it, what aspects of his character are they that um, make people so angry? Is it arrogance? Is it uh, the fact that he got rich being a banker? What is it about him? How does he come across? Well, it's a very interesting question because it's, it's at the heart of the paradox of what the French want from a president. So on the one hand, they want a strong, almost imperial uh, 
uh, president in the mould of de Gaulle or, or Mitterrand and, and that, that kind of imposing character. But at the same time, they have a disdain for real, a real disdain for arrogance in politicians. So really, he's between a rock and a hard place. And he's tried to cultivate that image of the imperial president, but he's failed. <laughs> because he just doesn't seem to have that stature. He doesn't seem to have that, that poise, really, to put it off. And he's made some really, really off-colour remarks to, to people that have complained about joblessness in France. OK, to, give, give, give to, some examples. He told a person that, well, all you need to do to get a job is just cross the street. And it's not quite that simple, as we know. Rather like Norman Tebbit back here in the, in the 80s. Get on, Get on your bike. bike. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, Macron's great success, that he has managed to unite the French nation in just how much they dislike the man at the top. So the people who supported uh, Mélenchon's hard-left agenda in 2017 don't like him. The people who supported Marine Le Pen don't like him. Even his own supporters are losing faith in him. When Macron was running for president, as a newcomer with no experience, with no tar of corruption, he represented a breath of fresh air for so many French voters. But since then, Macron, uh, as has been pointed mm. out, he behaves more like a divinely appointed emperor of Europe mm. than a democratically elected president. But it hasn't taken very long. It hasn't. Uh, since the beginning of his presidency, he has given the impression that he's more interested in trying to run European-scale foreign affairs and in, uh, constitutional concerns than doing the day job of looking after the French economy. And as, uh, as has been pointed out by one of the guests, the fact that he won't even make an appearance mm. at the height of the biggest protests that France has seen uh, in a very, very long time, is a measure of just how much content mm. he seems to hold for his own people. I, is this because he's, he's naive or because he is truly arrogant or that he lacks the intellect to be able to understand who to, how to deal with this or, or the empathy? Why do you think he's... Like this. Well, as has been pointed out, he is caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. He has to be uh, a, a powerful imperial figure, but at the same time, the French don't like this. However, he could be authoritative without being quite so aloof and condescending mm. towards people. Mm. So it's a combination of problems which any president would have dealt with. If Mélenchon or Le Pen had won, they would have had these problems as well. Mm. And also the specific character of Emmanuel Macron, who seems to believe that he has some sort of destiny and that the rest of France just needs to step in Does line Does this seem him. to suggest he's, he was just a one-trick pony, that his greatest um, achievement was simply to get elected? Oh, yeah, he'll be wiped out at the next French election yeah. because people's confidence in him has completely evaporated. A little bit like Alexis Tsipras in Greece. He embodied hope of something fresh, something new, uh, but has been demonstrated to be plus à change. And at the next election, he won't stand a chance. Definitely, definitely. And this, this, is, this is, for me, the really worrying thing about the next French presidential election, because we've seen the left in, in Holland, we've seen the right in Sarkozy, we've seen the centre in Macron, we've seen uh, Marine Le Pen begin to lose support uh, in, in, because of her failings in the previous election. Who is going to step into this vacuum? And we're at a very dangerous point in French politics where the rules of the game have broken down. People mm -hmm. didn't see Macron as that much of a trailblazer because he's a centrist. So they were like, OK, so Trump is in America, we've got Brexit in the UK, but Macron's different. Actually, in a lot of ways, he's really not because he is someone that's upended the rules of the game. And for me, I mean, w w what can come next after this? Mm -hmm. Well, let's throw that question to, to our contributors in, in Paris. What does come next? Ban, first of all. Oh, I think we've entered the political battle of the next European election. Um, the European elections, and then as your as your other guests talking about the, up, the next presidential elections. Look, I think Macron um, Macron's communication problem has been there for a while now. I remember watching a CNN interview with Macron a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, during the interview, he tells Farid Zakaria that he doesn't care about polls. He doesn't care about what numbers he has, his popularity. Look, Macron is an, he has an appeal, but his popularity is dwindling. Everybody knows that. But he turns and tells the, the, the person interviewing him that he doesn't have midterm elections. He was elected on a mandate, and people should listen to him because, according to him, in the next 10 years, people will find out that he was, that he was right. That he has this some kind of arrogance. I don't know where it came from, to be honest with you. I think Russell was trying to explain his this European, um, you know, the, the symbol that he's representing, European leadership symbol, as if he is like a part of another leadership that is a little bit detached from France. Mm -hmm. For the past weekend, the French 
only heard from the prime minister. We, were, we felt like we don't have a president, to be honest. He's mm. supposed to speak tonight. Let's see what he's going to say. But so, so, so the question was, and I appreciate what you've just been saying, the question was um, if he's going to get wiped out at the next election or if for some reason he can't stay where he is at the moment, what comes next? Look, I don't think he would be wiped out in the next election. I think we are too far from the next election. But he, I, he, he, is, he is building a new type of support also through this movement. This movement, yes, it's against Macron. This is this movement. Yes, it's against the pre president. But I'm, when I'm, when I talk to people, there are there are people who didn't really care about Macron or really didn't vote for him. Now they feel like, oh, look at these guys who are causing violence. Macron is you know has been proposing sound reforms, and these people are not are not listening. They are detached from reality. They just want to create chaos. I think there is a new political battle being shaped, and Macron is trying to ride away by by saying these people are, you know, these people are violent, they don't give us a good future, so yeah. stay with me. OK, so, so perhaps what he could do is, um, even though he's disliked, um, the alternatives are, are worse in the eyes of so many people. So, so, Karina, is there, in your opinion, any chance of him, in terms of his long-term survival, uh, perhaps beyond the next election, or is he going to fall before that? I don't think he's going to fall before the next election. I think that we're lucky in terms of the possibility of this movement empowering um, a far right, uh, a far right politician. We're lucky that the next elections aren't until 2022. Um, I do think that in order to hedge against that, first of all, his government is going to have to make more reforms. They they seated on the on the gas tax itself. But there's a tax on the wealthy that Macron had gotten rid of, that his government had gotten rid of last October, um, which is a big sore spot for the working class. And again, it's just kind of about his general general behavior. And his would, general would that be a cosmetic change, the, the reinstating the, the wealth tax? I mean, did it actually make very much financial difference? Or does it I just a, a, a seem abhorrent to people who haven't got much money? I think it does make a difference, and I think that it would send a signal that Macron is at least willing to reach out to the working class as opposed to just kind of obeying the desires of lobbies and big businesses. And I mean, that's kind of, these, these protests were originally portrayed as a backlash to a measure to fight climate change. Um, but I mean, where I was on Saturday, there was, there were people who, had signs that, you know, that expressed that they also care about fighting climate change. The idea is that as the working class, they're tired of being the ones who are taxed and that big yeah. businesses mm -hmm. that Macron is kind of friendly with should be bearing the brunt of that effort. As we look to the future, um, we need to consider two things, I would think, as we come to the end, towards the end of the programme. That is what was mentioned there, which is the far right. Um, you know, he, he did win the vote. But that was only because the, the, the other camps were, were totally split. Yes, yes. Yep. Now, is there any possibility that those extreme groups, from whatever position they are in now, sensing his vulnerability, could come together in a way that they haven't done before? And then I want to get on to the Europe mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. What we're going to see in France uh, in its immediate political future is the same as Britain. The centre uh, is no longer viable, and, the, and Macron represents the failures of centrism. So many people's hopes were invested in him that this would be a great movement to reform France, reform Europe, hasn't worked. Just like the British, uh, the French future belongs to either the hard left or the hard right, and the French are going to be offered a choice of that at the next election. So. In the remaining years of his presidency, I agree that Macron's not going to go before his presidency. He'll paper over the cracks yeah. uh, and change some laws in order to stay in. But these are cosmetic changes. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is not really going to stop, this is not going to do anything to stop him from losing the next struggle. My prediction is that the next French presidential election is going to be a choice between Jean-Luc Mélenchon mm. or Marine Le Pen, the hard left or the far right. Yeah. Make a choice. And what does that do to the European project, which is so central to the vanity, if you like, of the current French president? By then, the British will have left, perhaps uh, acrimoniously, leaving a huge gap uh, in the European budget. We'll have seen uh, a new European Parliament, which I predict is going to be quite strongly Eurosceptic, mm -hmm. a new Commission, and a new German government, which will have uh, not, which will lack the resources, the power.
power and the popular mandate to... And the personality. And the personality to Because although to she's plug Minnie the Merkel, gaps. we don't know very much about her. If she wins. So, it's, uh, yes, yeah. of course, if she, if she yeah. wins. And I think that this cuts really at one of, the, one of the key aspects that Macron has really failed at, which is to tackle the sort of parasitic nature of the French state. Mm -hmm. Right. So one thing that people are really unhappy about is not just big businesses and rising inequality. They're looking back at those that are supposed to serve them. And, and the, 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 the spend of GDP that France has on the state is enormous. Politicians are earning, you know, 10,000 euros a month, free housing, mm -hmm. perks, mm -hmm. expenses. People really are looking back at the state. And I think this is this movement is. Um, really about looking back at the state and saying, well, why are you guys so privileged? Why are you reforming us and not yourselves? Okay, so, so if, 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 if he wants to protect um, his political future, what he could do is institute the reforms yes. that the people have been asking for. Yeah. What, at all, what is at all likely, though? Because we're recording this programme before he goes yeah. on TV at the end totally, of the day. Totally. Well, what does he have to do? Well, this is, this is the thing. I don't think he can deliver on major reforms, right? I mean, people, people have, have seen the lack of union power mm -hmm. now in France and said, well, actually, no, France has is, is escaped its ideal type as the unreformable, unionised economy. Now maybe something is possible. What this popular movement has shown is it, it's still very difficult and you can still get a large number of people in the streets without the unions. I think he, he will dither along mm -hmm. the rest of his presidency, make a few cosmetic reforms, mm -hmm. make probably a few more off-colour jokes about, you know, people need to kind of get off their bottoms and, and get a job. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really foresee a, a bright future for his presidency. OK, so, so Van, does that mean these protests will simply fizzle out, um, but the discontent will remain? Uh, or, or what are we going to see? What, what does he need to say on TV? Well, that's a good question. What does he have to say? Oh, I think he has... I, I think he will be... He will be facing a choice tonight. Either, that, either he will escalate his rhetoric just as he has done this weekend by tweeting uh, at complete disregard of the protesters. He'll disregard them and call them uh, radicals who are threatening the country's stability. Or he has a choice to extend an olive branch to the protesters. We haven't seen that so far. I think it will be a much wiser thing yep. to extend an olive branch. Just, just a quick one, because we need to move on to Karina before we come to the end of the programme. If he's going to extend an olive branch, what is going to have to be? Uh, a pack, the package that he's offering. Well, he has to offer some form of a, some form of a, a new, uh, you know, something that hasn't been tried before. Some kind of a national dialogue. Some kind of like an integration hmm. uh, of these yellow yellow jacket protesters. This movement. There may, may be some group of them. Hmm. Talk to them. Uh, listen to them more. But there is another protest coming over coming this weekend already. It's uh, it's mm -hmm. we are living in an uncertain times right now. Karina, does it feel like that in in France? Uncertain times, uh, perhaps dangerous times in France. If you happen to be out on the streets of Paris, or is it still just one of those French je ne sais quoi, uh, etc., etc.? I think it's somewhere in between the two. I think that the violent elements of the protests have been largely overblown. Paris is not burning. I keep seeing tweets from from people, all of, I'm American, from people in the US saying Paris is burning, the UK is falling apart. I mean, Paris is not burning. The France is, France is very used to large-scale protests. That said, I think it's dangerous for Macron. I don't really think that there's anything he can do. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, even even seeding ground on the on the fuel tax um, hike was too little, too late. Um, and so, at okay. this point, I don't really know what he can do. Very, very quick thoughts from you two. The Labour minister said it was a catastrophe for business and the economy, and for Macron. One one would imagine. Uh, is is it as bad as that? I wouldn't say it's a catastrophe. It's, defi it's definitely a problematic in the run-up to Christmas where people don't want to go in the streets to do their shopping. People mm -hmm. don't want to go to France on holiday because they're worried about whether they're about to get the plane home. I don't think it's a catastrophe, but it's definitely an inconvenience. But I think for him tonight when he makes that speech, the only way for me he can salvage his presidency and take on uh, something from each of these voices of the far right, the far left and, mm -hmm. the, and even the centre is to reform himself. 
reform the state, reform the political establishment, and then people all, might come out. All of which has proved impossible to do so far, or perhaps unwilling. It's, very, yeah. very. It's quick. not you in his personality. Me. At the very beginning of the French Revolution, when the mob stormed the Tuileries Palace, King Louis XVI sat down and had a glass of wine with the revolutionaries to listen to what they wanted. That, that is not in Macron's character. He's not the sort of person who will sit down and listen to the mob. He will be aloof, stand back, mm. and then will make a pointless speech on television which will satisfy no one. Do you think he's lost? Oh, yes. And I don't mean lost in terms of his support. Do you think he just doesn't know where to go and what to do? People voted for him because he was inexperienced and not corrupted, but he's inexperienced. OK, well, listen, thank you very much indeed. What is it? His uh, popularity rating down to 23% um, at the moment, which is about as low as we've seen from any one time. The Labour Minister also saying uh, he, Macron, would announce immediate and concrete measures in response to the crisis. Well, perhaps by the time you are watching this, we will have heard them, whether they're going to make any difference or not. We have to wait and see. Uh, from my two guests in Paris, thank you very, very much indeed. Fascinating times, not since 1968, uh, which I have to say I do remember watching on the news. Have we seen anything like this? Thank you very much to my two guests in, in the studio. And look, it is still a country worth going to, oh, yes. even if it's just to get a nice bottle of wine for Christmas. It's definitely worth going to Marseille. <laughs> thank you for watching. Thank you for joining me. We hope to have your company next time. From me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team. Goodbye for now.